is the subject of today or for today is exciting. Now we're in our series. I think we're four weeks into our series. Uh, we may be somewhere close to four weeks into our series. Got a couple of them to go. And um, we've been um, talking about, are you woke yet? Now we've been taking back the term. However you use that term's up to you. We use that term a little differently. When I say woke yet, I'm asking, are you spiritually awake? Are you waking up in your spirit? Are you becoming more like Jesus now? We are finishing February. Do you know that? We are almost done with February. It's almost March in 2024. So now that you know where you are, um, how are you doing? We started talking about New Year's resolutions. We started talking about small things that we put in our life for big results. And by now, after two months, I know that you are healthier. You're more physically fit. I know that maybe you've lost a few. I know that your relationships are better because you're practicing relational discipline. I know that spiritually that you're growing because you begin to put small things in your life, doing them consistently to see a, uh, an unbelievable result. So I'm gonna assume that's right since no one's saying no and we're gonna keep it up. So good job. If you keep it up between now and the end of this year, by the end of 2024, you're gonna be a different person in the very best possible way. Now we started off talking about transformation, that it was possible for people to change, possible for somebody like me to grow and to change. Somebody like you, you can grow and change. Do you know you're not too old? You're not too set in your ways. You're not too stubborn, I don't think, right? No, there's not too much water under the bridge. You can still grow, you can change. Romans 12 says, don't be conformed to the image of this world or the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll know what God's good, pleasing and perfect will really is. So we are talking about transformation, waking up like a butterfly, going in a caterpillar, coming out a butterfly into a cocoon where God is doing an amazing work. And God's done some pretty cool stuff in you guys. Last week, we talked about prayer. Anybody remember that? Anybody watching online remember that? And I talked to you about the second time that Jesus reminded his disciples how to pray when they asked him. He repeated himself. And we really broke it down into six very simple steps, very simple principles that Jesus gave his disciples. And if you remember, I gave you a template and a, and a challenge to go and pray for six days, to go and pray that way on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, and on Saturday, and to see what God did in your life, see how you were changed. Five simple minutes, five minutes a day. And I have to confess, I was surprised how many of you guys actually did that. Now, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands because I'm not trying to embarrass anybody who didn't. It's up to you. But you know, if you wanna change, you have to put forth a little effort, don't you? A little effort. Change always happens through effort. We know that if we wanna lose a few, we know what we have to eat and not eat. We know what we have to do as far as exercise. And we know what happens when we're sedentary. If we wanna have a good marriage, we know what happens when we try to prefer our spouse over ourselves. When we wanna have better relationships with our kids, we know that sometimes we have to put in some effort and to, to do things for them and spend time with them that maybe we'd rather spend on ourselves, but we do it because it's right. Spiritually, it's no different. We can't be lazy and just sit back going, all right, God changed me. He expects us to get involved in the process. And so prayer was part of that. And today I'm going to be talking to you about a really important part of that. And it's exciting. As a matter of fact, it's so exciting that if you dig in, if you apply yourself, if you say yes to a challenge that I'm going to give you in just a few minutes, and some of you will, and some of you won't, I promise you that in six days, you will see a difference in your life. And that's a big promise to make, isn't it? If I was your boss, I'd make you. If I was your professor, I would assign it. But I'm your friend and I'm your pastor. And so I'm sharing with you. I'm asking you, in a sense, I'm begging you to give this a chance because whether or not you're a Bible scholar and you think you got it down, or whether you have never opened the pages or the book or opened the app in your life before, today is a day that if you lean in just a little bit, and I promise you, I'm gonna put the cookies on the bottom shelf. That's where I like them. I promise you, you can be a different person. Today, we're talking about the Word of God, the Bible. And we're gonna talk about the Word of God, and we're gonna talk about it according to what the Word says about itself. And I'm just gonna tell you right off the bat, I believe that the Word of God is absolutely true. I believe that it's inspired by God and I don't believe there's any error in it. 
I don't just believe that it's inspired by God in concept or principle and that human authors were left to fill in according to their imagination. I believe it was inspired by God and that the words of God were given to human authors and in spite of or in addition to the human author's personality and perspective or experience, the truth that we need to base what we know and how we live was given to us and it was a miracle. In 2 Timothy, the apostle Paul tells us, all scripture is God breathed. And when God breathes, that's the same word for inspiration, that he inspired it, that he gave it to us so that we not only can learn from it, but be transformed by it. And I know that that's a polarizing statement. I had a friend after first service who came up and he said, you know, I started reading the Bible and he said, it looked like a bunch of junk to me. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, I started in the beginning and at first it started off really well. And then I saw people live to be 700 and 900 years old. And he's like, this can't possibly be true. And I said, well, what happened? He goes, well, I kept reading and I found out how it could be true. Now, I love that honesty of that journey because to arrive at the conclusion that I have arrived at and that I hope you arrive at, that the word of God is absolutely true, you have to at some point acknowledge the fact that maybe it's not. And it's okay to look at honestly at both sides because I want you to be a thinking person not a robot that's been programmed by somebody so that you don't know how to process this world and to exercise your faith. But I believe that the Bible is inspired by God, given to human authors and compiled in a supernatural and miraculous way. And I believe that its words are necessary for us. Now, all scripture is God breathed. That means the sum total of scripture put together in what we consider to be the Bible. I believe that the other books that people have collected along the way are not scripture, they're not the Bible. They shouldn't be considered the same as scripture or the Bible. I don't think that the books that some other religions use are on the same level as scripture. I don't think the books that people supposedly found in the desert or in the caves after the canon was concluded and tried to add them to the Bible, I don't believe those are on the same level as scripture. You can find things that are true in history books and in other biblical texts or scriptural texts, excuse me. But very simply, right off the bat, the assumption that I make is all scripture is God breathed. Now, if you don't believe that, you're welcome here. If you have a hard time with that, that doesn't mean we're not friends and it doesn't mean I don't think you're smart and it doesn't mean that I don't think that you have faith. You're welcome here. But to understand my perspective on teaching and my perspective on where we're heading as a church, you have to understand that what I teach comes from the word because I'm not smart enough to guide or direct you, but the Holy Spirit of God points me toward truth in scripture that I point you to and we grow as a church. So it's God's word that has the power through the Holy Spirit who does the illumination and the direction, which we'll talk about in a second. Now that's a lot. And at some point we'll have a Bible study on a Wednesday night and we'll probably talk about how scripture was compiled and the canon came together. And it's fascinating history and, and supernatural and requires a little faith along the way. I don't have enough time to talk about that right now. But what I can talk about is what scripture says about itself. All scripture is God breathed. Now, if you don't believe it again, then you have a problem with scripture, right? Don't kill the messenger. It's right, you know, right there in the pages of 2 Timothy 3, where God is saying about himself, I'm telling you the truth. I just wanna make sure you're not saying, Rick, you're an idiot. Um, you know, it's not me. I'm just communicating to you what's in there. All scripture is God breathed and it's useful. Now what that actually means, that word useful means necessary for a few things. One is teaching and not the process of teaching, but the content of what's taught. I can teach you and, and uh, give you stories and try to be funny and I can go back and forth across the stage and not step across my little taped marks here and do all sorts of things that I think are engaging to try to get your attention. And that's not at all what the Bible's talking about. What the Bible is talking about is that it's the body of knowledge that you need to live your lives. That the information that you need to construct a worldview, the information you need to process current events, the information that you need to be able to look at your past and to at least have some level of understanding, your ability to look into the future 
and not know what's going to happen specifically, but in general knows who is in control of the future and have a pretty good idea and broad brushstrokes about how things are gonna play out. That it teaches you how to have relationships with other people. It teaches you how to become a different person. That the Bible contains the content you need to live a godly life. But 2 Timothy doesn't stop there. It said it's useful for teaching, but it's also useful for rebuking. Now, this is where some Christians get excited because they love to weaponize the Bible. Oh, I got some scripture in here that I'm gonna give you because you need to change. So they take a giant Bible figuratively or literally and run around smacking people with it, trying to convince them how bad they are and how right we are because we stand on this side of truth. You may never have been around a Christian who weaponizes scripture, but I have, and it's dangerous and it's disgusting. And this has nothing to do with you taking truth and smacking somebody else with it. This idea of, of rebuking literally means that there are false beliefs in our life. Maybe we've gathered from our past. Maybe we've collected through education or you know, experiences with current friends. Maybe it's just the way we're wired. And they're contrary to the way things really are because the spiritual reality, the kingdom of God is the real reality. And what this literally means is that when we engage the word of God done correctly, not reading just for information, but for inspiration or illumination, that God deposits truth into our lives and withdraws falsehood or error. Like an old couch. You got an old couch, you need it gone. And so somebody comes and picks up your old couch, but they don't just pick up the old couch and haul it off, which is therapeutic and awesome to see, but they leave you something that's much, much better. In fact, what you really need. And that's what scripture does. And many times we don't even know the couch is old. You encounter the word and you realize I've got old couches in my house and truth begins to be deposited. Now, it's not just that. There's a compound thought here, rebuking and correcting. The word of God's useful for correcting and correcting doesn't just speak to wrong ideas. It speaks to wrong actions. One of the best compliments that I could ever receive from you about teaching is that teaching is easy to understand, but hard to hear because the word of God sometimes is difficult to hear. And we are only able to change as much as we are able to listen and learn about ourselves without running the wrong direction. That when we encounter the word, sometimes we just realize that I've got wrong thoughts and wrong actions and wrong attitudes and behaviors and they've just got to change. And it's not your grandma telling you or your mom telling you or your pastor telling you. It's the spirit of God pointing out the truth of God that comes from the word of God pinpointed into the heart of a person of God. And your spirit begins to soften and transformation occurs. You see why I want this so badly for you? This is the stuff I mean, it's God's communication to us. And can he communicate in other ways? Sure. But he never does it in a way that's contrary to his word. And without understanding his word, you never know if God's communicating to you or not. It's the, where you start and where we, where we begin. Hebrews tells us a little bit more about this idea of correcting and rebuking. Hebrews says, for the word of God is alive and active. Alive means that it sets us alive in Christ. We were once dead and now we're alive. We can be a new creature in Jesus. And active, and active literally means it accomplishes a purpose. So God woke you up spiritually to accomplish a purpose that he has for you. The word sharper than any double-edged sword. Now, the Hebrews was written to a group of Jews who were living in a Roman occupied territory under Roman occupation, threat of violence, threat of persecution, threat of death. They saw it all the time. It was a military sort of an environment. And so a two-edged sword would have made a lot of sense to them. It doesn't make quite as much sense to us. The two-edged sword was the sword that they did the killing with. And if you saw a two-edged sword out of its scabbard, there was a pretty good chance something bad was gonna happen. And so the apostle Paul is saying that the word of God is active and alive, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. 
It penetrates, even dividing the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Now, this next part gets really personal and really interesting. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of whom, to whom we must give account. When a Roman soldier was walking somebody toward punishment, many times the person who was going toward punishment, whether it be capital punishment, corporal punishment, or just imprisonment, they would do like uh, perp walks today. We see on the news, right? They try to throw a jacket over their head and run from the car to the courtroom and nobody gets to see them, but they didn't allow that in this culture. And this imagery in scripture communicated by the original language and understood in its original context was that when a Roman soldier would walk somebody toward their punishment, they would take a small dagger and put it under their chin and force their head up to be able to look and see the people in the crowd who they had at least in turn wronged and the accusers. And if they lowered their head, the sword would penetrate, which wouldn't have a very good result for them. That they were forced to look face to face with their guilt and the consequences. And the word does the same thing to us, which is uncomfortable. But at the same time we're pronounced guilty, we're also pronounced innocent for those of us who are in Christ. 2 Timothy 3.15 says that the word of God contains the words that lead to salvation. That although we are guilty and deserving of death and punishment, that as we raise our eyes and come face to face with God, that instead of giving us what we deserve, he can respond with compassion because of the work of Jesus and offer forgiveness, which should in turn bring humility because it's nothing we did to deserve it. It's just simply God's grace and his mercy given to a person like me, which compels us to live differently. And this is all what the Bible says about itself. As you listen to read, study the word of God, it literally begins to cut away the sin in your life and to create in you a different person. So what do you want out of your life? And what if the only way to get there was through the word? And what if it's not as hard as you think? What if you don't have to go to seminary or have been in church for 30 or 40 or 50 years? What if it just takes a little effort on your part, a little discipline? And when we give a little, the Holy Spirit of God does a lot. And you'll find that instead of just looking for information, you will find illumination and inspiration and power. And if you're not careful, you'll discover your purpose. But I'm gonna to talk to you about that in just a minute. We're gonna come back after we sing. And I wanna give you one of the most practical tools that I could possibly give you to be able to just dip your toe in this whole encountering the word of God thing. The cookie's on the bottom shelf, but the choice is up to you. If I could make you, I would, because it's so important, but I can't. So I'll ask you, friend to friend, when we get there, make the right choice. I love to sing things that are true. And I know you do too. And I, I hope it translates online as well as it does here in this room. By the way, so many of you join us online. And if you are, thank you for joining us. And I would just personally love it if you would just put your name, even your first name and where you're watching. Uh, we check the comments and it'd be really interesting to me to be able to just know where you are and know that you're connecting with us. And if you're in town, come in and join with us because this is amazing. Now, I wanna talk to you a little bit more about the word, but we're gonna get very, very practical. Thank you, sir. 
Um, how, what if you knew somebody who, um, let's say, had a 10-year head start on somebody else, somebody maybe who um, knows 10 times as much about the Bible as the average non-Christian or person who's just getting started? What if you knew somebody like that, okay? If that was true, if you had somebody who had, say, a 10-year head start on somebody, or you could put 20-year, 30-year, 40-year, 50-year head start on somebody studying the Bible, uh, knowing the Bible, over somebody who maybe is a brand new Christian or has never studied the word before, then you should ask yourself a simple question. If this person knows 10 times more about the Bible, are they 10 times more patient? Are they 10 times more joyful? Are they 10 times more loving than the average unchurched or non-Christian or person just getting started with the Bible? Is their heart softer? Are they quicker to forgive? Are they less judgmental and condemning and proud? Because if not, the Bible has been used for information and not illumination. And when I say illumination, what I literally mean is that the Holy Spirit of God, part of God, one of the ways God expresses himself, turns the light on in your life. And you find that even sometimes small quantities of scripture make amazing changes. Because after all, Hebrews tells us the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword and effective at accomplishing its purpose. Now I've got a volunteer coming up here, Aaliyah, if you could come up here with me. Um, I'm gonna try to illustrate this relationship with you very simply. And it's a really complicated relationship. You hold this and don't let go. It's really important. I think the string's long enough if it goes to the ceiling, but if the whole thing would be ruined if you let go. Are you okay? No, I'm just kidding with you. We'll be all right. I checked the string. Aaliyah's helping me out. Now, um, this is uh, us. This represents us. Now, we were born into the world. The Bible says born sinful. Um, I look at it like Jesus said, sheep without a shepherd. He looked at the crowd, uh, the crowd, harassed and helpless, right? Us, we were born into a world where we drifted. And you, if you're honest, you know what I mean when I say drifted. You know what it feels like when you think circumstance has come and done something or fate or twists and turns that you haven't seen and that you're not sure why you ended up where you are, but you just know that you're here and you can't really make rhyme or reason of it. Well, that's the condition we were all born into. It's like a balloon. You can let it up a little bit if you want to. And I'll just go ahead and take it here for a second. And if you just let the balloon up and you just let it go and you just let the balloon drift wherever it wants to go with no direction, whatever air current happens to push it, it can end up who knows where, right? But all we know is it's here and it's flying. And some of you may feel like that. I don't know where I'm going. All these different currents are pushing me. All I know is I'm here and I seem to be flying. Now, James tells us there's another condition. Now you can hold it again here for me, Ali, if you want to. And, and that condition in James chapter one, verse eight, and James chapter four, verse eight, he talks about being double-minded where we can have a foot in both worlds. I wanna be Christian, but I don't wanna be Christian. I want what God wants, but I don't what God wants. I want what God wants. Romans 12 says, right? Don't be conformed to the image of the world, but be transformed. And literally there are two currents. So if you have the balloon and, and I'm going to pull it this way and I'm going to say, well, I want you to go this way. And I'm the current of the world. I want what I want. I want you to make bad decisions. I want to ruin your life. I want you to live for yourself. I want your relationships to get worse. I want you to be more hard hearted and less, less self-aware. And then you come over here and you grab it from me. And then you take it that direction and you're the Holy Spirit and you walk over that direction. And then what you want is what God wants. And you want for us to grow and for our hearts to be softer and for us to be more like Jesus. And then I come back over here as the current of the world and I can grab you and I can pull you back over here. And so you live your life being pulled back and forth between two currents, between two worlds, never really becoming one or the other, but being neither, which is a miserable place to be. But yet here you are. So you have the Bible. I'm gonna need your help again, so don't go away. Come on over here. So here's the Bible. And um, let's just say that we're gonna be a person who goes, all right, I need truth in my life. I need the teaching that comes from the word. I need rebuke. I need the, the word of God to deposit truth and withdraw error. 
I need correction. I need uh, my behaviors to be altered and modified because I'm tired of stepping in it and making things worse in my life. And so, um, you know, you say, I'm going to go ahead and anchor my life around the word of God, around the Bible. Now, that's good, right? That's good. We're anchored around the Bible. And you can learn all kinds of stuff because after all, you are now anchored to scripture, which is where unfortunately many, 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 many Christians stay. And they think that if they sit and soak, that that's all there is to our faith. And again, the book of James tells us that all they get are big giant heads with tiny little hearts and hands that do nothing. And it breeds arrogance and pride and it makes Christians hide and defensive and makes churches judgmental. And we're filled with knowledge, but nothing really good happens. And so as we continue this passage, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the last compound thought that the author gives us, that Paul gives us, is he says that the word of God's useful for training us in righteousness. You know what righteousness is? Right actions, right? Just right actions. It's us living the way God wants us to live, making right decisions based on the decisions we have available to us. Um, training in righteousness so that the servant of God, you and I, people who say we want to serve God, are thoroughly equipped for every good work. What does that mean? That sounds churchy. So you can figure out what your purpose is, the purpose God has laid out for you, and you can find it and you can do it. Where you can begin to live your life, not for you, but for the pleasure of God who's created you and has something planned for you that not only will blow your mind, but will make you finally realize that you have been anchored in stability and grounded with hope in a future. But this is not enough. God, through his Holy Spirit, has to take you through the Bible, through this book, through this truth, and now just begin to carry it back and forth, Aliyah, if you will, just in between the, the tape marks there, and move through this world because you've been created to do good works. Now, I don't know where she's going, but she does because she's God. And the way that I know that I'm communicating correctly with God is it's consistent with the word, that I'm being informed by the word, that the word is being transformed in me or within me, changing the way that I think. And so as Aaliyah moves throughout life, representing the Holy Spirit, she's directing me and guiding me, but she's doing it through the Bible. Now, there are other ways that the Holy Spirit can guide, but it's never inconsistent with scripture. And the only way to know for sure that it's him is to know this right here. So this is where you start and this is where you end. Thank you, Leah. You did great. I appreciate that very much. You did a great job. And so I want you to be transformed. I want illumination for you, my friends. I want the light to come on. I don't care how long you say you've been a Christian. I don't care how much Bible you know. I mean, that's great for us to know the Bible, right? I've studied the Bible for years and years and years and years and years. What I wanna know is, is your heart softer now than it was yesterday? Are you more forgiving now than you were last month? Do you show love more often than you do or now than you did six months ago? Are you more self-aware now than last year? Because if the answers to these things are no, it doesn't matter how much Bible you know, the Bible ain't working in your life because you're not doing it right. You have to open your heart up to the spirit of God to deposit the truth of God that comes from his word into you, a person of God, and you will begin to live a different way. And so just like last week, I wrestled all week long with the most practical way that I could leave this with you guys, my friends. I told you, if I was your boss, I'd make you. If I was your professor, I would assign it to you. I'm not, I'm just your friend and your pastor, so I'm asking you or begging you. I just created a tool, a template, not a formula. Don't misunderstand. And it is in your notes. And there's a QR code that'll be up on the screen. And it's so simple, almost too simple. And it's just a few boxes, a few categories that just really walk down um, this passage, this 2 Timothy 3 passage. The second Timothy 3.16. And not every single scripture that you read is gonna tick every single one of these boxes because it's the sum total of scripture together that second Timothy 3.16 is talking about. 
And if you're a person that doesn't like boxes and doesn't like templates and doesn't like formulas, I don't either. But what I'm doing is giving you a push because many of you, if you try to read the word, you open your app, you flip, you point, you open the pages, you flip, you point, you say, God, if you're guiding me, let me read something. And then you end up reading something from Leviticus about dietary laws and qualifications for a priest. And it doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means that I would point you a different direction as you get started. And so in addition to this template, I just put six simple scriptures in your notes, six. And by the way, there's six days coincidentally between now and next time we meet. Six very simple scriptures. There's one for Monday, one for Tuesday, one for Wednesday, one for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And I'll just give you a hint. They build in getting in your business. Now they're not difficult scriptures to, to read through, but they get in your business. Easy to understand, hard to hear. And here's my challenge to you. Print it out, make it a fillable PDF, recreate it and write it in your own handwriting if you don't like to be told what to do. But work through this passage or these passages, these short scriptures, one per day if you want, or six days on one if you want, or three days on one and two on another. I don't care, just get involved and do it and ask yourself these questions. First of all, teaching. What does this passage teach me about truth? Does it teach me the way things really are? And then read this little passage that I've given you and just, just read it. For me, I did Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 this last week. I did it, ran the template. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. So I went through, this is in your notes also, my answers on the template based on the scripture that I, that I picked. Just so you can see, in case you're wanting to, to figure out at least one way that it's done. But when you look at one of these passages, ask yourself, what does it teach me about the way things really are? Okay, now spend a little time, not a lot of time, five minutes, whatever, 10 minutes, not a lot of time. And then move to the next question. I don't mean five on one, I mean the whole thing. You don't have to take a lot of time, just get started. Rebuking, pretty tough word, but in the box it asks the question, what errors in my spiritual beliefs does this passage challenge? <laughs> That's an interesting one, right? Does this passage challenge any of my preconceived notions about church, about Christianity, about God, about others? Does it challenge any of these things that I've thought were true? And then be honest, nobody's gonna see it. No one's gonna check your work. Burn it if you want to later, it doesn't matter. Move on, correcting. What changes in the way I live does this passage inspire? This is where many Christians stop. I see it. I understand it. I got it. But they never do anything with it. What changes in my life, in the way I live, does this passage inspire? And it's not your grandma, and it's not your mom, and it's not your boss, and it's not your teacher, and it's not your pastor telling you it's just you and God, because before you get into this, there's a simple prayer that I've written across the top and, and it just says, ask God to meet you in this passage and to guide you into his thoughts. And that's how I start. It's right here on the template. You don't even have to remember. God, meet me in the passage, guide me to your thoughts. And all of a sudden you're thinking of ways you might wanna live different. And then if you're like me and you're honest, you're gonna say to God, help me live differently because I can't do this on my own. And that certainly comes next. And um, the final one is training in righteousness or for right living. What does this passage prepare me to do with or for God? What could this passage possibly be preparing me to do with or for God? And then you stop. You don't have to go any further. It's not the only way to study scripture. There's lots more. Sometimes I just read because I want the quantity. But when I really want transformation, I usually just grab a nugget like I've given you on these six little sample scriptures here, some of my favorites. And I just take some time and I just put them in there. 
The Bible says you hide the word of God in your heart, it'll keep you from sinning against him. That's a great reason to do it, right? And then when I'm done, when you're done with this little exercise, each day, because you're gonna take time each day on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, you're gonna pray the prayer at the end. And the prayer at the end is very, very simple, but I think it's very, very important. And it says, God, teach me through this passage and bring its truth to my mind in expected ways and surprising ways throughout my day. Change me and make me more like Jesus. So I told you that this was gonna be an easy thing to do if you choose to um, make a little effort. But I wanna remind you that nothing in your life that's good comes without effort. Sitting back and folding our arms before God saying, change me if you want to is spiritually irresponsible and immature. And we do it in no other area of life except our relationship with Jesus. And as reminded in Romans 12, and as illustrated here <laughs> with the balloon, when we make a little effort, God takes us a long way. So, are you gonna do it or not? If you have your own Bible study method and you study copious amounts of scripture, I still challenge you to do it. Just see, it's different. Sometimes different's good. If you have never cracked the pages of a Bible and you're not even sure you should, what's it gonna hurt? What's the harm? Let's put the burden of proof on God and at the end of six days, tell me if I'm wrong. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the time we've spent. I thank you for this amazing passage of scripture and so many of us have been bored by your word either because we haven't worked hard enough to understand or we've listened to teachers who try to make it too heady and above our grasp because it's been communicated by someone in a hateful way because sometimes Christians can be a little narrow-minded and a little judgmental, a little exclusive. And sometimes we use your Bible, your word as a weapon to divide us from the world around us instead of unite us at the foot of the cross. And sharing the truths in your word is so important, but living them first is critical. So together as a church, as we're working through these simple spiritual steps for growth, I pray that we wouldn't skip this one, Father. And so this is my prayer, that for each person who's here today or also watching online, that they would just simply accept this challenge and remove any of their preconceived ideas or conclusions. Put the proof, the burden of proof on you to engage in something as simple as this and to see what happens. And then I pray, Father, that as they do this, as they give you an opening, that you would turn the light on in their spirit and that they'd never stop. We love you. I ask these things with confidence because of Jesus and because of who he is. I ask these things for my friends because I love them and I want this for us. So I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.